I've been having this idea for a while to talk about performance-related talks, and I've been going through some design patterns recently. And I think design patterns are something we often study in university, maybe, or read a book, and then we kind of forget about them and revisit them later. So uh, it's amazing when you revisit things after another few years and kind of come away with different takeaways. So today I'm going to be talking about a design pattern known as the flyweight design pattern, which really is about performance, uh, or at least minimizing resource consumption. So I want to go ahead and give a talk about this. It might be a refresher for some folks, might be brand new for others, uh, but I think this is a pattern that's good to add to your programming tool belt just as another tool that you can use. Uh, so with that said, here's my information, and we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, so Klaus gave the nice introduction here. I'll let this uh, slide stay for a moment, but you can, of course, find this uh, on any recording. Uh, or again, Klaus has shared my YouTube channel. Uh, the code is available, although I don't have super complex code examples today. But sometimes it is fun to play around with the code and try your own experiments. And if you'd like to see those examples, I'll push them here. Most of the code should be pushed there already as well. Uh, and my slides already uh, will be posted to my website directly after this meetup. Uh, so again, you'll find the slides and the links to everything uh, as you need. Uh, so here's the abstract, again, that you uh, read that brought you here. So I'll just leave that there. Um, but again, as mentioned, I want to go ahead and start talking about design patterns, again, just to give a little refresher about what they were. And as I was researching and putting together this talk, thinking about what design patterns are, I think the Wikipedia definition actually has done a nice job here. So we'll get to that in a moment. Um, but the design patterns themselves are templates for solving a variety of problems. I think that's always important to emphasize that they're not solutions necessarily, but they're good blueprints in the same way that when you build a house, you might talk with an architect and say, I like this design and maybe you want to change a few things, maybe for efficiency reasons or space reasons, uh, same things in you know computer science that we care about. So oftentimes, since we have had these different things or problems that we want to solve, like how we create objects and data or structure our code or just understanding how our code behaves and organizing that, those are sort of three of the common patterns uh, that we try to break things out, the three sort of uh, blueprints. Um, and that's just a taxonomy or an organization that we've come up with. Uh, I certainly don't want us to be limited to just creational, structural, or behavioral. We might have other categories, such as concurrency patterns, for instance, that you could find a whole other list. But these are usually the ones that we learn from and where the flyweight's going to be uh, derived from today, this sort of taxonomy. Um, so again, those three sort of creational, structural, and behavioral categories were popularized from this book, which I think many of you have probably uh, seen at some point. If you haven't, it still is worth reading. Uh, it's a book from 1994, but a good book uh, you know, holds uh, for a long time. So it's still worth seeing uh, how folks uh, wrote this, and the examples often can be relevant. Uh, but I would push you towards uh, this book as well. <laughs> so I always have to surprise Klaus at least once, but uh, his book is very nice if you want lots of modern C++ examples. And he's probably too humble to uh, admit that, but I'm going to do it for him. <laughs> it's a little surprise for you, Klaus, um, if folks want uh, lots of modern examples. So, uh, so with that said, though, uh, what's common is you'll find in either those texts or on the web, this sort of recap of what this design pattern is. Uh, so again, going through the definition here, uh, again, it's a reusable solution to a commonly occurring problem. So these, these patterns that we find are, you know, as a result of, um, you know, looking at and studying software engineering, looking at and actually reading code and seeing what kind of things reappear in software that we write or different pieces of software. And again, they've been formalized, again, to help programmers push us towards a, a solution that'll probably work. Again, it's just an idea. It's not always a perfect fix. Um, but again, design patterns usually do a good job pushing us in the right direction. And again, having some structure or how we think about code generally is the important part. So again, are we creating something? Are we structuring our code? Or are we concerned with the behavior? That's another mental model uh, beyond just working with the code you can have. Um, Object-oriented design patterns, again, typically show relationships between classes or objects. Again, 
Um, the design patterns book, the original one, tends to use a lot of object orientation, but that doesn't necessarily mean we always want to uh, use or need to use object oriented uh, paradigms. Again, it's just another way to, to think about things. And folks might even think of object oriented uh, programming as a design pattern in itself. I'm going to try to show an example of that later on uh, with the flyweight pattern. Uh, and then again, um, design patterns are sort of, again, a just structured uh, approach to computer programming. Uh, and sometimes they're, you know, kind of intermediate level. So if you're just starting your C++ journey, you're in a great place with the Munich uh, user group to learn what's important. Um, again, this could be a next step, studying some software design, reading some code, and learning about patterns. Uh, so there's a full entry if you want to read it uh, later on. Um, <clears throat> but again, the point overall here is just to... Um, understand how we can use some prior solutions to solve current uh, problems. I'm going to also add, you know, maybe if this design pattern is familiar to you, maybe you're an advanced uh, C++ programmer or a programmer in general, you might be interested in starting to take a look at how languages try to incorporate patterns. So for example, there's a visitor pattern, and you'll even find in the C++ library, stood visit. Uh, in various ways that some of these common solutions make their ways into language might be an interesting way for you to think about uh, design patterns and, again, the worthwhileness of studying them. So as we get into this talk, let's just look at a problem here to sort of understand where a design pattern might be useful. So I sort of want to set the stage in reality here with an actual um, program that we can build here. Uh, whoops. Let me go away from that. There we go. Um, so a problem domain here, uh, and I like game programming. Again, that's part of my background, games and graphics programming. Um, so let's look at something like this. Now, we've got this nice scene here, a bunch of um, you know warriors in some fantasy game. And, and what I can say about games is these days are becoming more beautiful. The graphics are becoming better. Uh, they're becoming more complex in the different interactions and things that you can do in the games, uh, which is really, really neat here. And we sort of want to support that beauty, whether that means more photorealistic graphics or more stylized cartoon graphics, whatever it might be, uh, as our hardware improves. Right? We want to be able to render or draw more warriors or you know, uh, heroes or whatever we may uh, <laughs> go them as here um, uh, at, at high resolutions and, again, make things look better. And the complexity uh, I've observed, meaning the different behaviors that we're able to implement. So what characters in a game can do, what things we can simulate in a computer game or some virtual environment uh, has largely improved in ways that we've sort of been able to layer complexity over time uh, in different tools, different products, like uh, Unreal Engine could be an example, uh, and build these sort of data-driven uh, games here. So when I think about games and all these different things that we're drawing to the screen, the, the organization of them becomes quite important, right? Because we're creating a virtual world that, in effect, is mirroring what we see in the real world. So it's an interesting exercise to think about sometimes, to just look at objects and think about, well, how would I structure them? What would they actually look like in code? Um, and this oftentimes mirrors an object-oriented approach. So that's what we're going to start with today, thinking about what are these objects, uh, and are seen, and how would we model them in code? So again, here's just another example on the right here, uh, looking at some code, and you know we see some horses and catapults and castles and so on. Um, and I always think it's an interesting design exercise to look at this before we get to the code and think, what do these uh, characters look like? What are their attributes and their behaviors? Um, so I could play a little game here. Uh, and part of that same uh, game that I was showing you, you have a, a hero or you know some warrior here, some good guy. <laughs> um, and I wonder, a question to the audience, and feel free to uh, paste into the chat here, uh, what attributes do you see uh, specifically of this character uh, towards the middle of the screen? What makes up this uh, object here? What are the attributes here if you were thinking about the member variables in a structure or class? And I'll give folks a moment to, to think about that and, and type that in. All right, so I see some from Klaus coming in. Yes, strength, speed, dexterity. He's got armor and health. 
And let's see, the type and magic. Yeah. Strength, health, and speed also showing up. Yeah, so we got all the different character attributes here. And that might itself be another struct that we wrap inside of this character. One-handed weapon. Yeah, so they have some sort of weapon here with a model. I've got the different pieces of armor and the equipment. Yep, great. The body shape, another attribute. Yeah, OK, excellent. You folks are giving a good analysis of all the different uh, <laughs> things that make up this character. It sounds like it's going to be a fun game to play. Yeah, inventory, so I've got to hold on to things. Excellent, excellent. So quite quite a few things uh, I'm hearing. Maybe we can agree there. There's a lot that make up this character, right? The clothing, the armor, the attributes, the body type, uh, the speed attributes, the dexterity, and so on. Their health. Um, if they're a warrior, somebody mentioned their type, or you know, an archer, perhaps. Excellent, excellent. Um, so I'll move forward from this. Uh, I'll give you an even. Uh, uh, you, you folks gave me a lot more to even think about here. <laughs> but you know, we could agree maybe we have something like this here, right? We've got this game object, uh, a name, um, you know, the attributes that you listed. Uh, you mentioned like the armor and so on. I'm going to include that under mesh here. So mesh is just a word for the 3D data, the geometry. Uh, folks mentioned uh, other things on the appearance, so the texture or the image, right? This character's uh, face, for instance, would be part of that, and all the armor and the tree and so on. Uh, drawn on the character. Um, the position, so there might even be some of the things in the, the world uh, where this character is located in the middle of the screen, the transform, how they're oriented, or if they're you know turned 90 degrees in one direction or the other. Uh, and then all these other things that you folks listed, right? Their actual inventory, their weapons, attachments, and so on. Maybe we have behaviors, right? We could have this be some sort of um, type depth to some function pointer here uh, so that they can do actions. I mean, this is just you know what fits on a screen here, but, but there's many things. That's sort of the point that you listed there. Um, so anyways, if we just look at this many things, uh, which could be reasonable, um, and this, this could be a perfectly reasonable implementation. Again, a disclaimer, I didn't work on this project, but I've looked at a lot of game code. And this could be a perfectly valid uh, representation for creating all those objects that we saw. If I flip back here in a few scenes, so all these objects might be carrying that information with them. Uh, their armor, equipment, inventory, their health, their body type, their, you know, what type of warrior they are, and so on. Uh, and again, that's that's uh, might be totally fine depending on the type of project that you're working on. Um, but again, when we think about computer science and programming, we're often thinking about things at scale. Of course, maybe you learn about these things like algorithms, like big O complexity and so on, which often emphasizes time. We care about the time here. Uh, but let's look at scale. Again, let's say we have a bunch of these characters here. Uh, again, just another example. Um, and again, you know, as this game grows in its beauty and complexity, and we have lots of different cool and interesting 3D characters here, um, what often happens is uh, well, we kind of toggle this number here. Maybe it's a magic number somewhere in our game. We say, let's have 500 objects. Um, and upon observation here, if you look at this picture, you'll notice this is the same uh, gentleman with the hat, <laughs> the same uh, clothing, the same shoes, uh, the same belt, and so on. Um, the orientation and the position of the character is a little bit uh, different, but we've got these 500 characters, okay? And they might be duplicates. They might be different. Maybe there are some variety in here. I just can't tell. Uh, but they look all the same to me. Uh, but I would say 500 might be a substantial number. And maybe tomorrow or, you know, uh, years from now, 1,000 or 2,000, however many characters we're trying to simulate in our, our virtual world, it's going to scale up. That's That's likely to happen. Uh, and again, if we think about this, it's always relative. 500 might be a low number. If I look at this 3D graphic scene with the different uh, blades of grass here, uh, there might be thousands or tens of thousands uh, of individual blades of grass here uh, to, again, simulate some real world. Again, holding on to some property, the color of the grass, the position, the type of it. Um, does it grow or not? What are the behaviors? And so on. Uh, and then there's lots of you know other examples here where when you look at a 3D world, uh, at least when I do, I see many, many, many different objects here, which is uh, why we get some of the beauty and the complexity. Uh, but we as programmers need to think about how we manage this. So the challenge here is 
what it's looking like, and as we observe this scene here, is I have a lot of copies of the same data here. The same character here in this scene, uh, this gentleman with the hat, all the different blades of grass, maybe all the flowers, uh, they look like copies, but there are you know, lots of pieces of data that we want to make our scene more realistic and uh, visible here. Uh, but we might also want some unique attributes. Um, you know, if, if in this scene here with this character, they were all facing the same direction at the same position, that would be really strange, right? That's not something they would see in the real world. Uh, and likewise with the grass, if all the blades of grass were perfectly straight uh, and you know equal in every way, that would look a little bit suspicious. Uh, maybe some of you who have a garden or a yard have a very nice one that looks that way, but mine certainly doesn't. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, again, there's different ways we want to sort of simulate uh, what we see in the real world. Okay, most of the time, every blade of grass is not the same height here. Uh, so, when we've got a lot of copies of the same data, um, you know, how do we manage this, or what what tools can we deal with this challenge? It's just another thing for folks to ponder. Um, you could. Um, let me give you a moment to think about this. Uh, but what are our tools to deal with issues of having copies of data and uh, having uniqueness amongst different objects? Let folks think about that. And I'll go back a, a slide here just so you can see the, the challenges so I don't block them. How do we deal with copies of data? What have you learned before? Well, of course, we'll learn something new today. Yeah, so I've got one coming in from the chat, shared pointers to common data. So to the character mesh can be used between different instances. OK, so we've got this idea of a fundamental mechanism of uh, sharing with shared pointers. Yeah, I'll take that and some ideas. Um, and then we've got another response command, immutable objects that can be used many times. OK, so extending maybe what types of information uh, when we use a pointer, you know, something that's immutable or const in the case of C++ uh, might be an indicator. Yeah, we can share this. It's read only, so it's not going to change. Uh, so we can repeat things. Yeah, excellent. All right, and if you have other responses, yeah, SOA, structure of arrays, right? So somebody's thinking about um, when we have big collections of things, if I have a structure of arrays of maybe some of these things that are part of our you know, inventory, the character's armor and so on, great. Uh, and then another tool we have, inheritance, for the common parts in a base class, uh, and you have the differences in drive classes, excellent. Now, oftentimes, in object-oriented programming, right, we're choosing between inheritance on composition. So those are our tools. We'll try to decide which one's the right one. Again, that depends on your problem. But again, those are many of the mechanisms we have. And again, these are just things that we want to put on our tool belt to think about uh, anytime we're solving a problem. Great. That's a great list here. Uh, so again, possible answers. Again, mechanism for sharing, pointers, uh, as someone mentioned. And there's a variety of pointers that we have. We have some sort of database. Uh, again, that could be like a structure of arrays uh, that we sort of organize things in. Um, and then maybe something, as folks mentioned, some sort of component system or maybe a way to deal with uh, inheritance for sharing commonalities between different classes. So excellent, excellent. Um, so you know, with this said, uh, with these ideas, we can actually start looking at the flyweight pattern to see now that we understand maybe the problem domain, what flyweight uh, actually helps us with. OK, so let's go ahead and move forward here uh, and look at the flyweight design pattern. So this is straight from the uh, design patterns uh, book, or known as the Gang of Four book. Uh, it's this idea that we're going to use sharing to support large numbers of fine-grained objects efficiently. OK, uh, now if I first look at this pattern flyweight. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I was trying to understand why it was named flyweight. Um, and, you know, as an English speaker, what I understand the word flyweight to mean is, you know, like lightweight. Uh, so in boxing, and I think this is true around the world, uh, it means like a, a lightweight boxer who's very fast and can move uh, very, you know, with great agility. Uh, there's some also speculation that flyweight is related to this term, flywheel. 
um, which has, again, something to do with being efficient and conserving energy. Uh, I couldn't find a clear definition, but I think those are close to um, you know where this term comes from, flyweight, so just if you're curious about that. Um, so uh, to the official definition, again, a flyweight is a shared object that can be used in multiple contexts simultaneously. Okay, so again, this is a pattern about efficiency and sharing. Uh, so typically, we use this pattern or where it's useful when you have a large number of objects sharing common properties. Uh, so again, if we have common objects with common properties, so we don't have to replicate them, uh, we can save space. And oftentimes, as a result, sometimes as a result of the structure of our code, as uh, someone mentioned, maybe structure of arrays, we get an improvement in performance as well. Okay, so um, that's again uh, the other thing to note with flyweight, where it falls in our taxonomy, talking about the different design patterns, is that it is a structural design pattern. Okay, uh, so what does that mean? A structural design pattern, uh, well, again, something to deal with code organization. So again, maybe it's related to how we're sharing things, how we're literally structuring the code using composition or inheritance. Um, yeah, that's that's the basic uh, idea. How are we taking uh, small pieces to build up a bigger uh, object? Okay, uh, so I can kind of keep that in mind just as you're thinking about structured patterns or, or if you know uh, other structural patterns, how to compare this. Um, so let's look at an example. Let's get into some C++ here. Um, we've got nothing you know, too wild, but just to understand what's going on here. Uh, so if by definition, a flyweight is a shared object that can be used in multiple contexts, our goal is basically to be able to create these flyweights or shareable portions of an object here. Uh, and I've got an illustration on the right side here. So what we really want to do is take what's on the top right image here and translate it into what's on the bottom right here. Uh, so this idea that every tree that has a similar mesh with the same bark, the same leaves, um, you know, that those are the things that are common. But there are some things that, well, if I just look at this tree, it's to the left of this other tree, right? Their positions are different. Maybe some of their parameters are different, like the scale and the height of the trees, for example. Uh, and that's what we want to sort of abstract out. Uh, so in this case, the model or the 3D or the 2D picture here, however you want to think of the model, uh, that is uh, the flyweight object. Okay, so just understanding in this pattern. Uh, so something kind of interesting when thinking about the flyweight, uh, if you read the Gang of Four book or articles online, is we start thinking about how to organize our objects uh, into sort of two different categories, those sort of parameters that we created. So again, when we did the exercise with our hero, um, we should probably think about beyond just the actual attributes, the, the member variables, whether that's intrinsic to the actual object or extrinsic, meaning is it um, part of a unique instance or part of a common instance to all objects that are heroes or knights or warriors. Uh, so again, an intrinsic state uh, is to the flyweight model. So that's uh, this picture here. This is going to be all intrinsic. Um, and the extrinsic is the unique stuff. Like for this, each of these trees are going to have something a little bit different about them. For example, their positions in the world. We want to position them all in the same way. OK? So again, just to make that uh, clear, the flyweight has its own intrinsic state or attributes. And the extrinsic uh, has these different uh, the, the unique parameters that we want to pass in here, OK? Um, so a very simple implementation, just breaking down this model, would be to look at something uh, like this here, with this uh, game object here, you know, some 3D object, let's say, that has some of the different parameters that you talked about, the dexterity, speed, whatever, that could happen to extract the position. Uh, and then the intrinsic state uh, that we'd want to capture is like uh, from this uh, model here, OK? Um, now, this isn't quite uh, organized properly here. Um, so I'm going to organize this properly in, in another slide or so. Um, but I think this is an interesting exercise for you to think about in any of your objects that you create uh, about separating out this extrinsic and intrinsic state here. Um, so that's, that's the idea here. Um, so uh, again, this is where the structural part of the design pattern comes from, thinking about how our objects are created with 
the unique attributes or the extrinsic state and the intrinsic uh, state here as well, okay? which we're going to use, uh, can use composition for. Uh, but the actual flyweight is this model here, so I'm going to rearrange this in a second here. Um, but you know, if I could tell you one sort of important takeaway from this talk, so if you if you had to leave, you know, <laughs> uh, this is the key takeaway here that I want you to start thinking about when you create your objects, what state's internal to that object and what's uh, the external state. Uh, and the reason for that, uh, and usually a hint to that is when you are able to use the word const, is you're probably able to share that part of the object uh, somewhere. So you could store that shared state in a database, you know, some structure of arrays perhaps, um, and actually uh, reduce your memory footprint. I think it's a good exercise to consider, even if it's just a comment in your code, just having extrinsic and intrinsic state to, uh, even if it's empty, just to show that, yeah, something could be shareable or no, these are indeed all unique instances. Um, let's see here. Uh, so I have one question coming in here. Uh, it's stated, I'm making a reasonably complicated system for a plug into a game engine. I wonder if I could make use of this somehow. I'm certainly uh, eating a lot of memory. Yes, this is an excellent pattern for games. In fact, uh, hang tight. I'm going to show you exactly. You might already be using this, in fact, if you're doing graphics programming. Uh, this is how a lot of our graphics APIs are actually structured to use this flyweight. So I'll try to help you make the connection uh, and show some mo more code here. Uh, let me go ahead and advance this one more slide. I can show you exactly, actually, how to do this. Um, in your game engine here for your, your models here. Uh, we'll follow this pattern. Uh, so here, here's the flyweight um, for uh, uh, the example two. Uh, and a follow-up on the question, uh, it's not for graphics. It's something related to Unreal's uh, procedurally PCG. Let's see, procedurally generated content, maybe, um, for procedural content generation. Uh, yeah, we might have to talk online about that, but I'm, I'm sure this this could be used. This is used very often in game programming. Uh, and someone is asking, uh, could mesh also be extrinsic? Uh, deforming the mesh to produce or uh, morph the objects as they are not unique? Yes. OK, so we'll have to think about this mesh here. Especially if, if we think about the mesh just as static geometry, then um, that can be intrinsic state. But we might want to split out the actual animation data, like the bones, for instance, uh, of the object that morph them. Uh, so again, there can be many layers to this. So this is why we sort of want to go through this exercise uh, exactly as uh, the comment is. The, the 3D mesh, if I think about it like a tree, that's not moving. But what if it is a hero? Uh, is the mesh the full thing? Can I split out the animated part? Um, and then as folks are mentioning, some things like the material and so on. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, or the, the skins, we call them, for the deformable uh, or animatable portions in graphics. Um, so anyways, let me go ahead and show this flyweight example too. And this is sort of the uh, pattern find, following the um, gang of four uh, definition of the pattern here, where again, we have our model. Uh, just to be clear, the model here, as I'm commenting on line eight, is, is the flyweight uh, portion here, right? This is the thing that we want to share, the flyweight, the lightweight, you know, shareable uh, object here. Uh, and we've got the intrinsic state, again, which could be a bunch of uh, const objects that we instantiate. And then one way that we could work with the extrinsic state is by passing it in through each of our operations. Right? So we have different objects, whether we look them up in some database or instantiate these uh, separately uh, with different parameters and positions, and we could pass that in here. Right? And, and you can think about how you might want to do this efficiently. Right? If the state gets very large, we might pass it in by reference and const and so on. Um, so again, we can uh, keep adding layers here uh, for improvement. But this is the basic idea here. Um, OK, so hopefully this makes sense too as to I always got a little confused when understanding intrinsic um, uh, whenever I spell it right, <laughs> an extrinsic state here. Uh, but that's the idea. You're passing in the external state into your flyweight um, to manipulate the uh, common uh, properties. OK. so. With that said, we've covered sort of this portion of the flyweight pattern here, uh, where we have the flyweights or the common shareable object, and then we might have um, uh, in, an instantiation of it where we pass in the uh, extrinsic uh, state here. But there is a little bit more here, this part that I faded out here. So let's kind of add that in here. Um, 
And this is where I think it becomes kind of useful to see how we apply this flyweight pattern in our actual code here. Another way to think about a flyweight um, is as a resource manager, OK? Or, or the flyweight factory, I should say. So flyweight, again, plays nicely with a factory uh, method pattern, which is a way to create objects. Uh, and in game programming and other domains, we call these resource managers. Uh, and there's a little bit of a pseudo code here, but I'll go ahead and show you an uh, example here on the right, where basically you could create some flyweight uh, model factory. So again, maybe this is for creating those different models or the meshes. Um, and if we look through this code, basically all I've done here is created a map here with, uh, we need to figure out some sort of key to uniquely identify the flyweight, right? So if I have a tree with different properties, right? Maybe that's the name of a tree and we load that up from a configuration file or something, or maybe this is a series of, uh, you pass in the uh, mesh and the texture and create a hash from that. Uh, however, you can create some sort of map Again, you can decide if this needs to be ordered or unordered. Um, you, you know, that's sort of your decision here. But that, that's going to be your sort of lookup to see, have I created at least one uh, of these objects that can be reused? And if you have, uh, then you can just return that uh, a pointer to that uh, instance of the flyweight. OK, so that's the basic idea. Otherwise, you go through the process of you know, instantiating a new model, populating it as you need, and then adding it to your uh, map or other structure that you decide. Again, it could be a map, could be a set. Again, you can uh, play around with this uh, a little bit here. Uh, but that's the basic idea here of creating the factory here. Uh, so you can look up your flyweights. Okay. Um, now, a little discussion here on sharing, uh, and it was mentioned in the comments, which is great. That's how I know I'm at a, you know, top C++ uh, meetup here, <laughs> you know, mentioning some of the modern features of C++. Uh, of course, I'm showing these examples uh, with pointers here, um, in part because they give you the ultimate flexibility, but that also means you need the ultimate uh, use of care. Um, so we might prefer some things like a shared pointer, for example, which is exactly doing that job to share. Uh, and maybe we want to reference things by weak pointers. Again, it just kind of depends on what you want to do. Um, we might be OK. In games, folks typically still use uh, raw pointers, although I think um, I think more folks are growing onto using some, some variation of a smart pointer or even a shared pointer. Um, so there might be some performance things to worry about if you have lots of objects with just little variation with shared pointers. I gave a talk about that at uh, Core CPP a few years ago. Um, if you want to see some examples of not just using raw pointers here. Again, I generally prefer safety, uh, even in performant applications. Um, and then I try to find better algorithms, but just wanted to make a little note on that. Um, and the other little note on that uh, for how you want to set up this sort of resource management is you could otherwise build some sort of handle system, uh, meaning just using integers to look up or index into your data. Someone mentioned this idea of a structure of arrays. Um, so I wanted to show that just as another way to show how you can reference uh, and, and share data, again, without even having to introduce something with, with overhead. Um, uh, it's kind of nice here. Uh, but before we get to that, uh, be our last example in a few moments, um, it's kind of nice to look for flyweight pattern uh, in the wild sometimes. Uh, and it's an exercise, again, I encourage folks uh, to think about. And again, before I show you two examples, we really already looked at one with graphics, <laughs> which I'll show you again. Um, has anyone seen Flyweight used in any applications that they've written or um, want to share in the chat their domain that they've used Flyweight and found it beneficial? I would be curious. Uh, so for our, our advanced listeners, perhaps who know this pattern uh, and are using it, where are you using it? Where could we find it in the wild? Uh, and someone's giving a comment. It sounds like entity component system. Yes, I'm going to mention components uh, at the end of the talk. <laughs> right? Yeah, very familiar patterns. Good. That's certainly in that same same pattern, uh, same family here. <laughs> and physics engines, folks have been using this. Great. Yeah. Right. So you probably have reusable, um, certainly reusable primitives. Or various maybe uh, uh, holes of you know bounding boxes and so on. 
Yeah, great. So physics engines, entity component systems, we see relation, great. Any others? Feel free to paste those into the chat. Let's see. Uh, yeah, I think in general, game engines, for example, you load in your mesh from disk, and then every object which renders that mesh references it. Yep, yep. And yeah, perfect transition to our next slide here. Why don't we take a look at that? I mean, here's a nice, again, example here with just different meshes. Now, these are all cubes, uh, or actually, these are all quads here, uh, I believe, uh, just four vertices. Um, but you can see they're all the same geometry. Uh, exactly as um, a member has mentioned here in the chat, uh, we're just referencing the same exact geometry. Now, we might apply some transformation that reduces this or scales down this quad here, which is what's going on in every instance, and of course, positioning in it. Uh, and this is the idea of instancing or mesh instancing in graphics programming. We're able to take the same geometry and repeat it. Uh, and all you do is uh, basically send in the uh, extrinsic state, things like changing the position and the size uh, in your graphics pipeline so that you can generate something like this. So here's 100 uh, you know, different shapes here, all referencing the same geometry. Uh, and you get a performance boost for doing this. Uh, here's a second example of that uh, with this sort of asteroid belt here. Um, and there's actually a, a link I've shared here uh, from where I learned this. Um, and anecdotally, I've done the similar experiment of you know recreating the scene here. Uh, and just by the simple fact of referencing the same geometry rather than creating and allocating the same geometry um, on the GPU, you can see an order or in some cases two orders of magnitude, so 100 times faster by being able to just reference the same geometry. Uh, you're reducing sort of that memory uh, pressure in some ways, <laughs> bringing that memory up to do other things here, uh, basically just redrawing the same exact object, but maybe in a different orientation or, or something, right? These are all rotated a little bit. Uh, and there might be a few different variations just to make it look interesting. Um, but that's that's the basic idea there. So again, this is this is a, um, a pattern for, for performance, uh, ultimately. Um, here's the one from the original Gang of Four book, which got me thinking a little bit outside the box here, just on text rendering. Um, again, if we think about it, if we wanted to render text very, very fast, perhaps even using a GPU, um, let's say in the, uh, you know, in this sort of English alphabet here with 26 characters, uh, you basically just have to be able to <laughs> draw that character or store the unique, you know, sort of glyphs here, uh, or the character, you know, in this case, you know, A, B, C, D, etc., uh, one time, and then. Well, the extrinsic state is just maybe where to position that character. Uh, and maybe some other things, like is it underlined or bold or, or something. But uh, ideally, you should be able to then render very quickly uh, text uh, in a word processor or text editor here. Okay, uh, So if we think about some of these examples, and we've had a lot of the, the gaming examples come in, there, there should be some uh, areas where maybe you have some const data and can reference it rather than just instantiating it over and over and over again. Right? It's const or read-only data. Um, the other thing that sort of opens up if we think about it is sometimes when we have const data, um, sometimes we can evaluate and, and set up that const data at compile time. Again, that's probably a separate talk uh, in itself, but again, could get us thinking about uh, instantiating more data at compile time and uh, being able to share that data. So just some more nuggets to think about in your, you know, whatever applications you might be programming. Um, OK, so as we're nearing uh, sort of towards the end here, I wanted to talk about uh, a related pattern here, um, this idea of component systems, which came up in the chat. Um, and this is sort of a complementary design pattern, uh, as mentioned here. Um, so the idea of a component is that, let's say, again, we take that same example here where I have a game object uh, shown at line 43 uh, on the code sample on the right. And basically, we want to set up our hero. So we want to add some armor to them and a sword that they were holding, and um, you know maybe other attributes, maybe a shield, and so on. Uh, this is an idea where we basically just have a vector, or it could be a map, or a list, some structure right, that would be appropriate for our game object to just add components to, um, and, and basically populate it that way. Now, those components, again, could come from some sort of resource manager, like the mesh, if that's a component we want to add to our object, uh, would be a 3D mesh that is, again, uh, shared here. So again, this is sort of a related idea here. 
Um, and of course, uh, we can add on to this component pattern and do a full entity component system, uh, which usually enhances this further and is a little bit more of a data-driven uh, approach here, which I'll, I'll show you in a second here. Uh, but again, that the use of a flyweight here by loading up each individual component that we attach to our game object uh, sort of reduces the weight of the amount of memory that we've allocated in our system. Okay, so again, here's the idea of a component. You know, ideally, what we want to get rid of is you know lines 14 through 17. Get get rid of this you know new component here. We want to actually get away from instantiating things and combine some of the other patterns that again. Uh, we've introduced maybe some sort of factory here to uh, refer to this uh, texture here, OK? Uh, and then we can add the components using our system as needed, but uh, instead use the flyweight factory here, if indeed those are the same textures, OK? Um, so again, on related uh, patterns here, uh, thinking about sort of component systems, I just wanted to give a brief uh, example here. Um, and this is a little exercise that I often do with folks but uh, with OpenGL uh, for graphics programming. But again, you could think about any sort of um, system, again, where you have shared data. Um, and basically, this is just showing how, and this is actually just in raw C code here, effectively, uh, you can create a handle-based system. So again, you're referencing the same data, the same shared data, but just with an integer, uh, which is a lookup in an array or a structure of arrays. OK, so uh, here's the idea. Uh, and this is roughly how your graphics APIs look uh, because they're performance sensitive. Okay, so this is just a short example here. Uh, but the basic idea is you have some, I'll call it a database or a context uh, in the case of OpenGL, uh, where you have an array of, say, 100 objects here. Okay, at line 17. Uh, that's going to be our shared data uh, where our geometry is. Uh, and then here's the actual objects or the extrinsic state here or the actual uh, you know 3d mesh data here and it's gonna be a pointer to you know some collection of data uh, and then the idea is um, for your uh, objects here you just reference the handle here into uh, the array so the handle again is just an integer or an index Again, handle is one of those strange terms. I remember when I was learning uh, Windows programming long ago, <laughs> there were handles to everything. Um, but I didn't realize it was really just an index into some uh, object array somewhere or some sort of lookup. Uh, so that's the basic idea, right? We can do fast lookups with uh, integers versus strings or anything like that. Um, so then that handle is actually when you're going to actually you know, create an object, you're passing that handle around and creating and instantiating data in a specific place in array. Uh, and then, of course, when you're using that data, you're accessing the array through some handle, OK? Uh, and again, you can share or replicate uh, data easily uh, in that way. Uh, so that's the basic uh, idea here, OK? And these are the comments. They're a little bit OpenGL uh, specific here. Uh, and I have some notes on pointers if you need those as well. Uh, but that's the basic idea, OK? Um, so that would be uh, another sort of uh, alteration of the uh, flyweight. Now, when you're actually using uh, this data, I should say here at line 43, the one amendment I'd maybe make here is to actually have comma and then you know pass in the extrinsic state where you're actually manipulating or um, the position or the scale of some object, let's say in a 3D world. Okay. All right, uh, so that's the basic idea here. And yeah, let's go ahead and move through here. Uh, and again, um, you, know, you could use your own data structures or a map or these types of things, but we tend to like integers. Um, <laughs> they work a little bit faster. Um, although the abstraction into your API uh, for using this flyweight pattern, you might again want a, to name things with a string. It, it might make sense to reference something by a file path or some you know unique uh, identifier otherwise. Um, to look up the, the shared data that you need. OK, so anyways, here's just uh, this idea of a handle system, again, approaching that same idea of a flyweight pattern, accessing shared data. And that's how we get those things like instancing um, and so on in the graphics examples that I showed you. Um, OK, uh, so with that said, let me just give you a brief summary of what we've talked about, and then we can um, I believe we'll take questions uh, in the Zoom uh, shortly after. Um, and how I want to sort of summarize this pattern is, again, with thinking about the, the pros and cons here. Pros, cons, and I threw in neutral because it could always 
argue or debate some of these things. Um, no design pattern is perfect. I think we know that. Coding and software engineering is about trade-offs. Um, but the pro here, and it's a big one, if I could put this in bigger font or you know two stars next to it, uh, this is a pattern that can greatly improve the performance of your program. Uh, again, we've seen since we're sharing, we're taking advantage of um, the you know being able to share uh, data, which is uh, excellent. And sometimes even how we're structuring the data, because we're putting it maybe in a structure of arrays and so on, we could get better uh, spatial locality and, and likely uh, better temporal locality as well as accessing things, you know, the same data over and over and over again uh, in that case. Uh, we could even think about pro in some ways that this is forcing us to organize our code and think about our code, um, you know, that might lead to some uh, improvements as well. Um, you know, we, we do need to think about, um, uh, and I, then this could be a pro, this could be, you know, just something to think about. But since we're sharing resources, you do get consistency um, as sort of a byproduct because you're sharing the same thing. <laughs> so again, whether that's what you want or don't want, again, it just uh, depends, but you might be getting a more correct result, right? Rather than procedurally or using some algorithm to create many, many variations of some hero, right? You, you can see that they're the same thing. And again, if that's what you want, it's nice to see. Uh, my other neutral is, again, with shared pointer, I've seen talks, I've even given talks about some of the potential performance issues with, um, you know, if you're creating lots of these objects in real time that are shared, um, sometimes that's a performance issue. In games, we generally don't do that. We create everything up front, and then if they're shared and managed, uh, you know, they can be cleaned up later. Um, so just something to think about. I mean, so that's a neutral. Um, the cons, you know, you lose some fine grain control of every single object if that's what you needed, right? If you wanted every instantiation of your object uh, to be unique, right? And in that case, you probably want to look at some of the creational patterns which have that as a, a pro, right? Use like a builder pattern or something to you know, create nicely all the different uh, attributes of, of some object. And, and then you could clone them on a case by case basis, let's say, or make a copy as needed. Um, but again, uh, if, if you're looking for performance, again, you use this. This is the right tool. Um, some additional complexity, I suppose, is added here. I mean, we are probably adding resource managers or factories. Um, but again, this is probably the right thing to do. This, this ensures we're instantiating objects <laughs> in a nice way here. Uh, we just have to know the pattern first, which could take some time. Or if you're introducing other folks on your team, again, that could take a little bit of time to get up to speed on. Um, OK, uh, let's see. There's just a comment that, yeah, as a non-native English speaker, uh, yeah, <laughs> the term handle is indeed strange. Uh, I, I agree. <laughs> Alrighty. So I want to point you to a few resources here. Um, you know, Part of this talk, or where I first learned Flyweight, actually before even the Gang of Four book, was from this uh, Game Programming Patterns book. It's a free book I always recommend folks. Uh, you can buy, I bought the physical copy because I loved it so much after reading the actual book. But uh, if you're doing game programming, which it sounds like we've got some folks doing, this is a great example, but they've also got non-game examples as well. Um, and interestingly, in researching for this talk, I found in the Boost library uh, some information about Flyweight uh, as well. And it's, they've got uh, you know their version of creating it and the rationale and so on. So again, uh, again as an advanced user, uh, at this group, maybe you knew everything about flyweight, but then you could think about how do I abstract this? How could I actually use this efficiently? Uh, how could I make flyweight uh, obsolete if there was something in the library? Uh, so these are the types of things we could maybe think about. Um, so with that said, um, I just want to thank uh, Klaus and everyone at the Munich uh, C++ group and the organization committee for inviting me. This was wonderful to give the talk. I was glad to see so many questions and participation. Um, and I think we'll uh, let Claus uh, give the next directions here. All right. So first of all, thank you very much. I enjoyed it a lot. This was, was a good uh, reminder, but also uh, gave a couple of really good examples. So while people are thinking about questions, actually, there is one already. So now let me say this first. This is now your opportunity to type in a couple of questions. If, however, you actually have... Uh, well, if you want to use the opportunity to ask questions in person, then please feel free to join us in the after talk chat. I just posted a link. Note it's a Zoom meeting. 
Yeah, but this is exactly why you then have the uh, the opportunity to ask questions in person. Okay, um, Mike, there is a question in the in the chat already. Okay, let's see here. So I throw uh, twenty thousand one. I see it. Perfect. Okay, yeah. I can see how the flyway pattern is very useful for working with generated data, uh, but can you use it with real world data, such as in a scientific or e-commerce application, where all the data is measured or coming from a database? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, again, I think this depends on the uniqueness. So certainly in an e-commerce platform, let's you know pick one, Amazon, where you've got a lot of unique pro properties, perhaps, you know, per product. Um, perhaps that is not something that we could use if every object is, in fact, uh, a unique entry in some database. Um, you know, maybe there are some commonalities we could think about again we just sort of have to go through that exercise of looking at our object and seeing what's the intrinsic and extrinsic state uh, and again it's it's fine not to use this pattern right we don't want to push everything into a flyweight um but if you sort of go through that exercise and see there's you know nothing when you divide up the object then yeah can't really use it um and as far as let's see in a scientific application or something yeah again we might run into the same problem where um you know everything's unique and again that's where the that's where we want to lean into our creational patterns and then we need to think of some other strategy if we want uh, some performance um yeah that that's what i can think of top of mind here mm -hmm. um, all right then while other people other people are thinking about questions um when i think about uh, the game industry i always have this data oriented design thing in 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 my head yeah mm -hmm. no object oriented programming and i actually was a talk in Back in 2018, I believe it was, mm -hmm. um, object-oriented program is dead. Long live data-oriented design. Mm -hmm. So, um, from your, from what you're saying, is this is a great idea to speed up things to lower memory um, requirements. Um, so, how how do these two things fit together? Yeah, hundred percent. So, even um, thinking about, uh, let's see, as my slides are still up, you know, our graphics APIs and with this sort of handle system or something like this. Um, th this is true. This is where engines are going. Um, again, it makes things easier to divide and conquer um, if I want to render things by just looking at the different structures of data and looking them up. Um, I think in practice, though, however, um, if I go back to the previous pattern here with components, uh, something like this, this is still used because of the flexibility. So it's, it's always kind of a balance here. Um, if I reference uh, an engine, Unity 3D is quite famous for having a very flexible component system, um, whereas there's other engines like um, or abstractions on engines that use purely entity, entity component systems for performance. So, so there's a little bit of a balance again. Um, games fall into that category where we're usually re reusing a lot of data, but sometimes we want um, unique uh, objects with unique attributes, so there is some sort of you know, components being added here. Um, now, that's not to say that they can't also be used in concert. As I mentioned, uh, this sort of component system, we could still be looking up things in a data-oriented way and building things. That is sort of the ECS uh, system. Um, and that talk in 2018 is quite a nice talk, I think, to listen to. There's that one and then the famous Mike Acton talk in 2014 yep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, on basically, yeah, get get things to, uh, you know, get your code to look closer to this here. <laughs> okay, thank you. All right, so th there's no further question. Um, perhaps perhaps we give them one, a, a couple of more seconds. You, I think you gave only one performance number. You said that performance can be improved by a factor of 100. Mm -hmm. I think this is what you mentioned for the graphic systems. Mm -hmm. Um, is this what, what I usually can expect, or does it strongly depend on what I do? Str strongly uh, depends on what you do. Uh, and that number, let's see, that's coming from these uh, folks here, uh, Learn Open GL, and I've replicated this. Um, now, this is a, you know, this is a pretty simple application here, but um, mm -hmm. the issue with Open GL is, you know, if you're otherwise drawing and rendering a full graphics pipeline per object, the advantage is Right? You could do 100 of these objects uh, at a time here. Um, mm -hmm. and, and this is measured like, again, 100 sort of a number thrown out there, but by frames per second and how much um, you know, you're going from, say, 30 frames per second to 3,000 or whatever. 
Um, you can expect there to be performance improvements. As always, I love giving performance talks, but um, I can't do it unless I actually show you a profile uh, to make any further claims. <laughs> yeah. But, All yeah. right. Then I suggest we switch over to Zoom to see uh, if there's any live questions, discussions, etc. So then thank you very much again. Yeah, I enjoyed this a lot. And um, yeah, once again, the invitation for everybody who's still listening, switch over to the Zoom chat. Um, hopefully it's much more interactive and uh, hopefully we have a couple of discussions about how to implement this, how to use this. Um, this might be a lot of fun. So Excellent. thanks again, everyone. Bye. We'll see you there.